Hi, I'm Diane McGarry from Drake at Arts. And I'm Tom McGarry, also from Drake at Arts. Today, we are here to explore music as a spiritual and nurturing medium with Nipmuc, Hawk Henrys, and Reverend Atula Jamir. Atula is the pastor of Calvary Baptist Church in Lowell. She earned her master's and PhD from Yale Divinity School and BU, respectively. Atula worked as a theologian, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> at the Theological Institutes in India and as a researcher for the International Bulletin of Missionary Research for the Overseas Ministries Study Center in New Haven, Connecticut, prior to assuming her pastorate. Thank you both for joining us today. So can you talk a little bit about music and how it is a spiritual and healing, nurturing medium? Thanks for having us. Well, since uh, Hawk is a musician, why don't you start about it, uh, talking about it, uh, especially because I have heard your music, listened to your music, and it's the, the originality and authenticity of your music is just amazing. It just touches the core of human heart. Thank you. Uh, before we actually began videotaping, we were chit-chatting a little bit about being a musician and what that label means. Um, and uh, maybe that's a little background uh, and why I, I've never really thought of myself as a musician. Um, I, I, I started playing uh, the flute, uh, at, I think I was about 33 or 32 years old or something. It's been 33, uh, 30 years, something like that. Uh, and my intention um, was to use the flute to articulate, to express things that I feel about life, um, to use it for prayer. Uh, and in my thinking about um, prayer, uh, I think that when we're communicating with creation, there's no wrong notes. But when you're a musician, there can be. Um, and uh, I, I didn't. I don't have any formal training. Uh, no, you know, no one, no one um, to learn from. Uh, when I first started playing the flute, uh, I would close my eyes uh, and imagine that this gratitude uh, that I wanted to express for living would flow through me and out the end of my flute. Um, and um, to this day, it's still what it is that I intend to do with my flutes. Uh, so I, I guess that's one of the reasons why I don't think of myself as a musician. Um, yeah. Your, your, music, Hulk, uh, your music, Earth and Sky, it's, uh, it's absolutely enchanting. I could listen to it endlessly and get lost in the, the beauty of the world you rediscover. Uh, my senses, when I listen to it, my senses uh, travels as it transcends the human world, rising to a heavenly space, but um, slowly brings me back to reality, leading me on a tour of our life and our world and teaching me how we ought to live actually live in the world we are part of. You know, it transports me um, to the world of my childhood, of the, the verdant forest and hills where birds are uh, comforting and friendly companions, uh, letting us know that we are never alone. So to me, your music, earth and sky is like a calling, a combination of lament and peace, symbolizing a peaceful habitat, uh, showing the universe with all its beauty, joys, and pain. So could you share with us more about the meaning of the earth and sky? Probably not. <laughs> I think you encapsulated it quite well. Um, so uh, earth, earth and sky was and is my effort to acknowledge 
the feminine and masculine energy that lives within creation, mm. lives within all things. I'm, I'm of the thinking that um, in, our, in our history as human beings, we've forgotten. Uh, and, and my desire um, is, is, to, is to remember how important my mother is and my father is. Uh, Earth and our way of seeing um, this creation, Earth is feminine, uh, sky is masculine. And those two energies, when they when they meet, when they join together, then life, uh, as we recognize uh, life in the forms that we see each day, um, uh, are possible. Mm -hmm. If if those two energies were separate from each other, um, then life in the forms that we recognize wouldn't exist. So it's simply. Um, uh, a way to one articulate that concept um, and hopefully encourage others to think about it. I, I'm, I'm a, a bit selfish when it comes to some things and uh, being a father, I, I, I really want my own uh, daughters to know how important they are. Uh, and again, our, um, our, our society uh, doesn't always it doesn't always say how important women are, um, no matter what culture. Uh, so I mean that was the that was the impetus for that song. I think I think in general though the the sounds or I'll say the music that comes from uh, from my flutes um, is inspired and informed by creation you mentioned birds uh and of course uh i think in our conversations both on and off camera i've mentioned uh, a few times how easily i'm distracted uh by birds that are flying by the window or you know outside um my songs kind of are informed by them by the sound of wind or rain uh the sound of uh snow and whales, uh, I, I'm, I'm in love with this creation and I want, uh, I don't wanna sound like I'm dictating that creation should become a part of what it is, a, a, a part of my music or you know the noise that comes from my flutes, but I really want it to be. I, I'm, I'm happy to hear when you and other people say, I heard the sound of a whale in that song or the sound of a, a bee buzzing or the wind uh, blowing through the trees. It, it makes me feel really good to hear that. Yeah, uh, when you were talking about the, 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 the earth and sky, uh, it reminded me of uh, one of our, the stories that I've, we uh, believe in our culture that uh, a long bamboo pole can poke the sky from the earth so that symbolizes the connection between the sky and the earth. There's always this interconnection between the two. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're never far from one another. And, um, and humans and God never far from, from each other. Uh, you know, as my fascination with your, with your music grows, I realize that your philosophy and the, uh, the Naga worldview are related. The core belief of the interconnectedness and interdependence of humans and the whole of nature. Like we have, uh, as you mentioned, and we, we mentioned, uh, we have many folk stories about birds, animals, and plants coming to humans' rescue. And um, the bird bulbul uh, mentioned before, mm -hmm. uh, it, there's an example of that bird showing a uh, water source to uh, two brothers during a severe drought. We also have rituals um, before cutting down a tree to be uh, for personal use. So mutual reciprocity and interconnectedness is deeply embedded in, the, in that culture. So it appears to me that when you work on the flute uh, and play it 
and when you're talking about the creation, you are completely immersed in nature. You become an element of nature. Your culture, your philosophy, your, uh, your art and gift of music is interwoven in the intricacy of nature. And you guide your audience gently toward that world and lets us imagine it. So how would you envision a world influenced by your music? That's a really difficult question to, to answer uh, succinctly. Uh, in, part of me wants to say, I would imagine a world um, without strife, without disease, without imbalance, without conflict, um, and where, the, where the conflict comes in for me in saying something like that, though, is that I, I recognize the benefit of those things, or at least I think I see the importance of conflict and dis-ease. Um, so, so I'm not so sure that I'd want to see a world without that. I'm not so sure that I would want to eradicate that. I think of my own life and think about the times I've fallen and literally and figuratively and the benefit, the importance that came out of that, the, you know, the injury, if you will, that resulted from my falling and how my life would be dramatically different if I hadn't had that. So Atul, I'm not so sure that I could really answer that without giving it, you know, a, a few days or weeks or months or years of thought. I mean, that's a really, uh, it's a deep question to ask. It's a great question to ask. Um, wow. But you, you, have a, you have a great fan, you, fan in me. And you have let me, let me help me to imagine that world through your music. And so you're already touching people's lives. And uh, you. you're al already showing the way. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, oh, go ahead. Yeah, you know, you go ahead. I um, I'm I'm of the thinking that uh, this this thing that we think of as culture, for for me, uh, culture is a reflection of relationship to the land, um, and I believe that um, we humans uh, all arise from a very similar culture because we all have a very similar relationship, uh, maybe historically, um, to this place that we call Earth. And I think that um, in part, some of the strife that uh, we see today, that we experience today, has arisen from the fact that we've just forgotten that, that relationship, uh, the, the importance of connection to Earth and the things that live you know, on the earth with us. Um, somewhere along the way, we've moved ourselves to the, to the peak of some kind of structure and um, forgotten that without the base, which is everything else that lives with us, we wouldn't be here. Um, and so I think, I think in general, when we can begin to remember our, um, interconnectedness relationship with earth and all of the other inhabitants on this earth, mosquito and whale and weed and giant sequoia, when we can see the importance of their being, um, not so much for our benefit, but just because they're important, then I think that our relationship with, with this earth and then with each other will change. Um, and change in a beneficial way. Absolutely, yeah. Well, Naga, you, uh, I didn't mention this before, but Naga people in Nagaland, it's a small state in Northeast India. So uh, they have a variety of uh, indigenous musical instruments that are purely made from nature, such as a bamboo flute, uh, 
cup violin made out of hollowed gourd, dried hollowed gourd, mm. and then bamboo mouth organ, uh, log drums hollowed out of massive trees. Mm -hmm. um, all these instruments are deeply connected to the people of the land. So your music, as you truly portray, your music uh, uncovers the powers of those indigenous instruments and the significant role that they play in life. You know, it reminds me of a tragic love story of two lovers uh, told for centuries in my culture. The woman dies due to an injury after being nursed by her lover. And in the, in the wee hours of the morning, uh, the, the man uh, announces her death by playing the, uh, the viol cup violin. And as the villagers heard the music, they understood that the woman had died and they mourned. Mm -hmm. So, you no, know, thus I'm thinking about your flute. How you, uh, does your flute, every flute you make, have a story? Do, do you create music when you carve out the, the, the flute? And how do you help people understand the story of your, of your music? I, I think uh, the flute has a story. Each, each of my flutes is unique. I, I tend to not make any two flutes that look exactly the same, nor do I, a lot of flute makers today use uh, European ideas of music with regards to how they tune their flutes. So they make them in specific keys and mm -hmm. things of that nature. And my desire has always been to allow the wood to dictate what its voice will be. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, if I'm out, the majority of my wood for th that I use for flutes, I, I gather in the woods or, you know, wherever I see a nice piece of wood that will become a flute. And sometimes that piece of wood might be four feet long or five feet long, you know, much too long for it to become mm -hmm. a, a, a flute. But after studying the, the piece of wood, either for a minute or a week or a year, um, the section that becomes the flute reveals itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I cut it to, when I take the rest of it away, then that's the voice, the, the, uh, on a very physical level, the length of the piece of wood determines the, the voice of the flute. Mm -hmm. um, so, mm -hmm. oh, it's a beautiful snow outside right now. Um, so if I, if I, sorry, uh, if I have a, a, you know, a six foot long piece of wood, but I only cut 12 inches from it, then, then the voice is going to be a relatively high pitched flute. The, the flute will be relatively high pitched. So, so one, my desire is to honor what the stick, what the piece of wood wants it to be, mm -hmm. uh, would like to be in terms of being a flute. Um, how is it that I repeat the, the second part of your question? How do you create your music uh, when you carve out the uh, the the flute? Um, also, how do you help help people understand the story of your music? Because when I, when I listen to your Earth and Sky, you know this is this is the best music flute music that I've ever heard. When it listen to earth and sky, it's just, it just tells the, a, a tremendous story of life and creation. I, when I'm playing in front of people, I share with them what, you know, when I'm, when I'm playing a particular song, I share the story of that song um, with the hope that I won't uh, box the listener into thinking that's the only way to interpret that song. Does, does that make sense? Absolutely, yes. I think uh, in our last or one of our discussions that we had maybe a week or so ago, um, I, I mentioned uh, that at one, one song that I played um, afterwards, uh, a woman came up to me and she said that it was so emotional for her when she listened to that song that she cried and she mm. cried and it was so sad and she thanked me because 
the sadness had been living inside of her and it, and it found it a way out. Um, and so she thanked me for that. And a short moment or two later, uh, another person came to me and said that it was the most joyous song that mm -hmm. she had ever heard. And she was so excited to be able to, you know, feel that kind of joy. And she thanked me for it. And I, I could only smile and be happy that, that the, the song allowed them to feel what they needed or what they wanted. So when I do share the stories of why I'm playing this particular group of notes, I try to do so in such a way that doesn't limit the listener. Wow. If that makes yeah. sense. Thank you. Well, can you tell us more about your holistic experience when you keep a piece of wood between your knees and go through the process of creating it into a beautiful and healing instrument. You know, the process, the process also involves the use of oil, uh, yes. I learned, yes. So it's intriguing as I look at it through the lens of a pastor and theologian. Please tell us more. You know, my, my process arose from, again, not having uh, a, a teacher, or any kind of knowledge about woodworking. Um, when I, when the idea of building flutes, you know, entered my mind, uh, you know, I, I knew that it somehow I had it, I had to make a, a solid piece of wood hollow mm. and I had to shape it. So there's a store close by where I live um, that sells uh, very old refurbished hand tools. Yeah. And I visited them one day and said, you know, these are the tasks that I would like to complete uh, in order to have a flute that I need to do in order to have a flute. Which tools do you suggest? And the person working in the store suggested certain tools and I, I purchased those tools and began using them. I didn't know about vices and, you know, the tools that would hold the wood. So I didn't need to use my, my own body. But as I you know, after a, a number of years, when I began to, to, to learn more about woodworking and other, uh, other woodworkers, uh, people would watch how I did things. They would make suggestions about getting a particular tool so that I didn't have to hold the wood with my knees and my chest. Um, and by then I had developed such an intimate relationship with both the tools mm -hmm. and the wood that I just couldn't imagine not using my body, you know, as, as a tool. Um, I, I love feeling, I use a draw knife, which is a long blade on, uh, attached to two handles. And when I position the piece of wood between my knees, which clamps it together and my chest kind of stops it, um, and I draw the knife over the piece of wood to shape it, uh, I, I can feel when the wood, I can, I can feel all the little bumps and knots and uh, that kind of, they vibrate through the knife and they vibrate through me. That, uh, that's so important for me in my process. Can you still hear me? Because I'm getting a signal that says my internet is gone. Am I still here? Oh. We're, we're hearing um, you fine. Thank you. Okay, what an good. intimate picture. So, I'm sorry? What an intimate picture. It's like you're oh. hugging the wood. Yeah. Um, and it allows me to be gentle in the process. It allows me to be deliberate and intentional. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, if you're, if you're moving a, a sharp blade across a piece of wood in one direction, um, as you know, my flutes are round. So as I turn it to shave the other side, sometimes uh, the big chunks of wood will want to come out. So what I have to do is just turn, turn the wood from one end to the other. Um, so I'm not forcing the wood. There's a, a collaborative effort, be, effort between myself and the wood and the tool. And my desire has always been um, for that kind of gentle energy to be a part of the instrument that I make since it's for prayer and I don't want to be harsh with it and you know, force it to be something that it doesn't 
want to be. Even gathering the wood, uh, I, I know you didn't ask this, but remember I'm drinking caffeinated tea. <laughs> Uh, when I go gather wood, I, I first kind of express my intention when I'm beginning to go out in the woods, you know, I, I just kind of articulate the fact that I'm, I'm out looking for a piece of wood to, to build a flute with, here I come. Um, and I always bring something important, you know, a, a gift to leave. Uh, so when I do find that piece of wood, I can acknowledge that I've, I've disrupted lives that relied upon that piece of wood. Uh, it, it's usually standing dead wood that I use, or I'm hesitant to really say dead wood because that wouldn't build a good flute, but it's, it's wood that's no longer um, growing. Um, but there are so many different organisms that rely upon that piece of wood, and I don't want to just take it without regard to them. So I... I leave a gift. Sometimes it's a, a song or sometimes a tobacco, which is really important. Um, sometimes it's money if I have any, which I don't usually. <laughs> I usually have chocolate, but I don't like to leave that because that's too important. I'd rather eat it. But sometimes <laughs> I've done that. Um, a flute. I've left flutes out in the woods and it's just a way for me to, again, express my gratitude and acknowledge that I've disrupted life. But I think that's such an important part of building something that's for prayer. I'm probably not getting anywhere near your question, no, right? That, with my... that is, that's wonderful. And that really relates to my culture. When, as I've mentioned earlier, when we uh, go out into the forest to, uh, to cut down a tree, tree for uh, personal use, for building a house or so on, they, uh, we spr sprinkle water or rice beer. Mm -hmm. That is the stable of the stable drink, uh, my ancestors' stable drink. So they would sprinkle some rice beer uh, on the tree and then they pray and ask for permission and give thanks mm -hmm. for, for the tree. So absolutely, you are really uh, relating uh, to creation. Um, Thank you, know, you both so much for this. <laughs> Just give me one more thought, Atula, and then we need to wrap up. But this has been wonderful. Thank you both so much. One more? You yes. Mean? So, so, you know, uh, Hawk, as a, as a Christian theologian, I see in your uh, process of carving the, 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 the flute as a revelation mm -hmm. of the deep connection between the create, creator and the creature mm -hmm. in the theology of life. God is making us and remaking us. Creator is taking every moment delicately shaping and transforming us into something beautiful and meaningful. So there is an intimate and tender touch to the work. And using oil uh, to rub the wood to protect it and to let it breathe, for me, is a powerful symbol of life and death. <laughs> Thank you so much, Hawk. <laughs> Thank you both. What a wonderful Thank you so much, Atula and Diane and Tom. It's, it's been wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Diane and Tom. Thank you, audience, for joining us. If you want more information about Drake at Arts, please go to drakeatarts.com. Thank you. Thank you both. God bless. Thank you. Thank you.